everyone. I'm Joel, pastor of Westwood Church. And on behalf of my friends who've joined me here, as well as all of the staff at Westwood Community Church, Merry Christmas. We're glad to be with you on this day and to take part in the Christmas celebrations that you're enjoying wherever you might be. We've entitled our gathering Joy to the World because joy is the mark of the season. And I'm also going to do some reflections around that great Christmas carol, Joy to the World. And we're gonna to sing together. And yet we realize that some of you are tuning in alone somewhere and others of you have a house full of guests. But whatever the case might be, have fun. Worship where you are and sing along or you can just lay back and listen. We think you'll find it meaningful in either case. Before we sing, I am surrounded by some incredible musicians and our worship leaders from our two campuses, Minnetonka and Chan Hassan, and I've invited some of them to share a favorite Christmas childhood memory with the hope that you'll do the same after our gathering today, that you'll share some favorite memories from your childhood and learn something about those whom you're gathered with. I know for me, it was running down those stairs. I was probably seven or eight, got into the room where the gifts were ahead of my five sisters and one brother, and there they were, five Tonka trucks unwrapped under the tree just for me. It was a memorable Christmas and a lot of fun. This is Ben Rosenbush, and Ben is the pastor of Creative Arts at Westwood. And why don't you lead the way, Ben? One of my favorite memories when I think of Christmas is my little brother. He had this distinct methodology that he would sneak under the Christmas tree without my parents knowing. He would carefully peel back the scotch tape just to reveal the name of the gift and then close it up so that he'd have to act surprised on Christmas Day when he opened his presents. But I, I never adopted that practice as my own, but I kind of was jealous of him. So He was probably not the only one to do that. Probably How about not. you, Mel? Well, um, my favorite Christmas memory is when I was a little girl, I got a kitten for Christmas, and I've always been a huge lover of soft furry animals. But one morning, uh, Christmas morning, my mom walked down the stairs in her bathrobe carrying this soft white furry kitten, and I was completely surprised, and it was such a happy moment. Oh, that's fun. And then also with us is Lauren. Lauren's one of our worship leaders and has a very interesting background growing up in a Russian Orthodox church with a Russian family. And that's influenced your favorite memory. One Christmas, my mom thought it'd be fun to put in the church's Balalaika Orchestra CD. And that led to a lot of dancing in the living room and just a lot of happy, funny moments with my grandparents and sisters. Teddy. I grew up in northern Minnesota, and I remember one Christmas, we had a particularly intense storm that wiped out any travel plans of all our family. So Christmas morning came, and our family was alone. So our mom let my brothers and I head outside into a quite literal winter wonderland. And the minute we exited the door, the house disappeared, and we were lost in a world of imagination for the entire day. Hmm. And I'll never forget it. Well, you can tell that meaningful moments create all kinds of favorite Christmas um, memories together. And we know that good food, being with family and friends, telling great stories and opening gifts are all part of that. But certainly, singing the Christmas songs are part of it as well. So join us as we sing together. Let's sing together, harp the herald angels sing.
Every Christmas we sing joy to the world and it's hard to sing it without smiling because when we sing it, something in us soars. Joy rises up. In fact, this hymn is still considered one of the greatest in the world today, which is astonishing because it was written nearly 300 years ago by Isaac Watts. And I'd love to share some stories about Isaac Watts with you today to see how God gave him songs that became our songs. Isaac Watts is the father of English hymnody and he started writing hymns because of a challenge he received from his dad. At just 15 years of age, he and the family had gone to a church service and while they were walking home, um, Isaac began to complain and complain and complain about how bad the music was in the church service and his dad finally stopped him and the whole family and said to Isaac, then write something better and he did. That very afternoon, he wrote his first hymn, and they sang it in the church service that Sunday evening. And then at 16 years of age, in 1690, he wrote the hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, which you know is still treasured as one of the greatest hymns in church history. It's an astonishing gift. And through his lifetime, he would write over 750 hymns. Isaac Watts was a Great kid, and he was a genius, to say the least. His common language was English, but at four, he learned Latin. At nine, Greek. At 11, French. And at 13, Hebrew. He was fluent in five languages. And yet he is best known for his poetry and the poetic reworking of the Psalms, which scholars still access today. And it's Psalm 98 that would be the inspiration for the hymn, Joy to the World. Joy to the world, but why? Well, the first verse gives the indication it's because he comes. In fact, that first verse, we sing, Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room, and heaven and nature sing. It's that first verse that is the most well-known verse to us. It's based on Psalm 98, where we're told to rejoice in God as king over all the earth, that the whole world is encouraged to rejoice that Christ has come and to receive him as their king. And so all of our faith stories, including each of us in this room, it all begins with a Christmas story. It starts when our eyes are opened up to the reality that Christ has come to be with us. And so the line, let every heart prepare him room, is pointing all the way to Luke chapter 2, where we find Mary wrapping him in cloths, placing him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. It's a picture that Watts was wanting us to see that Jesus, he comes to be with us and he wants us to make room for him, but not everyone will make room. And so the carol is crying out for the whole earth to receive Jesus Christ as king, to make room, to open up your hearts and your lives to the Lord Jesus who is come.
to the world. But why? Because he comes. But then Watts elevates in verse 2 that he is Savior as well. We sing, joy to the world, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ. While fields and floods, rocks, hills and plains repeat the sounding joy. The lyrics are corresponding with Psalm 98, where all of creation is asked to join in the song. Fields and floods, rocks and hills, even the plains. I don't know if you'd notice that in verse 1, when Watts speaks of Christ, he refers to him as King and Lord. But in verse 2, he refers to him as Savior. And he's pointing to Luke chapter 2, verse 11. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. It's a profoundly personal declaration. That is, when you know that Jesus has come into the proximity of your space and you receive him as Lord of your life, something happens. You become a new creation. You are given a new song and you repeat a sounding joy. And the sound of joy that gets repeated again and again in your life is the reality, the humble knowledge that Jesus came for me and that Jesus saves me. So when we repeat the sounding joy, we do so with a humble gratitude. Thank you, Lord, for coming. And thank you, Lord, for saving. That's the invitation. And it causes us to raise a really good question. That is, when did we come to this point in our lives when we became aware of Jesus coming for me within my own personal space? And then who made you aware of it? In the Christmas story, we know the angels announced the news. It was likely not an angel who announced it for you, but somebody else. But from that time when you first became aware of his coming for you, what was the distance to that time when you've actually received him? And maybe that's still a journey for you. For some, that's a shorter distance. And for others, it's a longer distance. So I've asked a few of my friends if they would be willing to share their personal story. In my story, I'm really grateful for my parents and grandparents who showed me who Jesus was before I knew who Jesus was personally. And so I grew up in that context, knowing this love and uh, faith was rich in my life from early on because of that. But it wasn't until my mid-teens that one of my good friends, who was actually our youth pastor and kind of became an older brother to me, uh, he showed me what an alive faith was. He had something, and he knew something about Jesus that I didn't. And I wanted that. And that lit me up with a fire, and it changed my life. And from that day on, uh, Jesus became 
a personal reality in my life. Well, I love telling this story. It means a whole lot to me. Um, like Ben, I grew up in a family that had a very authentic faith um, in a church that was very thriving and alive. Um, my relationship with Jesus was very important to me from an early, early age. Um, but as an adult, I found that the circumstances of my life left me in a place of despair um, and a lot of darkness, a lot of anxiety. And um, there was just a miss. Something was missing um, from my faith at that moment. And um, I decided to take God at his word and just cry out to him and see what happened, to see if he could restore me, restore my joy. And he really, really did in a very um, real way. He healed me body, mind, and soul, and heart. And um, my life was drastically changed. Well, I grew up going to church, and my parents taught me that Jesus was God and that he was important to worship, but it wasn't until my freshman year of college when I got together with some old high school friends and I could see that their faith had changed, and they could see the hurt that I was experiencing from past decisions that I'd made, and um, they just really encouraged me to go to Jesus with my hurt and my regret and just confess it all to him. And that was the moment when I really feel like I developed a relationship with him and just changed the trajectory of my life. I was raised in a God-fearing home as well and was very aware of God's character my whole life growing up. But it wasn't until I moved away from home at 20 years old to Colorado, it took that time of stepping away from normal tendencies of life to take that knowledge of God's character and turn it into a personal awareness of God's character. And I remember entering into a worship event one evening that I was not totally sure I was going to go to, but I ended up going and about midway through for the first time felt a very tangible realness of God's spirit moving on my heart. And I had never felt that before. And it was that time that I realized that God was very real and his love was something that was for me and for me personally. So I leaned into that feeling and my life has been different ever since. As you've heard in all these stories and maybe know in your own as well, Jesus comes into our lives as Emmanuel, the one who saves us. Emmanuel, that name that means God with us. Our team wrote this song and we'd love to share it with you in a time of reflection about the joy that God is indeed Emmanuel in our lives for you today and for all of us.
Joy to the world, but why? Because Jesus comes, because Jesus saves, because Jesus blesses. So Watts elevates the blessing that will go to the nations in the third verse. No more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow, far as the curse is found. He's reminding us that we live in the midst of the promise. And inspired by Psalm 98, he's telling us that God makes known his salvation to all the earth. And then Watch takes us all the way back to the beginning when Adam and Eve sinned into the garden and all of creation was cursed. But now Christ comes and the curse is removed. And in the second coming of Christ, the curse will be completely eliminated. There'll be no more thorns or thistles infested into the ground. There'll be no more sin or sorrow or suffering. There'll be no more crying or mourning or pain. Joy to the world because joy becomes the voice of hope. And that's a very personal thing for all of us when we stop and reflect about it. I know my dad, who died eight years ago, absolutely loved Christmas. And I had the privilege of being with him that last evening of his life. And I shared with him the Christmas story many times over and over again. And then a few days later, I preached at our Christmas Eve services. And I really don't remember much of what I preached about, but I do remember standing with my family that Christmas Eve, singing joy to the world. What perfect timing. The reality that we come against tough challenges, that as far as the curse is found, that is, as far as brokenness and challenge and suffering and death are everywhere around us, that is the curse trying to raise up its ugly head against us. But we know it has already lost. And that's why the promise is there. The promise that we live in the midst of the promise of a salvation that is for all peoples. That Jesus comes now. That Jesus saves now. That Jesus blesses now and in that blessing comes comfort in times of need and in that blessing comes quiet peace in the reality of personal turbulence and global upheaval. When you stop and reflect about Watts and what he was writing, what he was raising up, the backdrop of it really becomes important because you have to note something. In the writing of Joy to the World, it was during a time when there was little joy in the world. It was a time of great suffering. In fact, uh, in Southampton, England, where Isaac Watts was from, there was national suffering. The plagues had gone all the way across Europe into England, into Southampton. Thousands of people died. There was personal suffering, the reality that even in his own family, his father, because of his faith in Jesus Christ, was put in prison again and again. And many Christians were persecuted and killed in that time, much like they are today in Syria and Iraq. And there was relationship suffering. He struggled in relationships. He was not born a handsome guy, and he didn't have a strong stature either. And his one chance for love came and went with Elizabeth Singer. Elizabeth Singer, who fell in love sight unseen with Isaac Watts because of his published poetry. And in fact, she just got caught up and threw caution to the wind and wrote a letter to him because of how passionately and deeply he wrote. She decided to ask him if she, if she could have his hand in marriage. She proposed to him, wanting to be married to him. And uh, it was an interesting thing when they met face to face because she would retract that offer and later write of Isaac Watts. Only five feet tall with a shallow face, a hooked nose, prominent cheekbones, small eyes, and death-like color. I admired the jewel, but not the casket that contained it. It's brutal, to say the least. And Isaac Watts struggled for some time. He was broken over love that was lost, but he also was confident in the trust of God that was his. He had a joy that filled him up because he knew the Lord was with him in the midst of it all because we live in the midst of this kind of promise. See, Watts is reminding us that joy comes to us not because of a life that is easy. The joy that, that he writes about is a joy of the soul, not the joy of an easy life. And we find that because his soul was captured by the birth of a child, it was captured by the explosive impact and beauty of Jesus Christ, that he was able to write joy to the world 
to find that comfort and that peace that comes to us in all times. The last verse of the Bible says something really neat. It says, in so Lord Jesus, come quickly. It's a prayer that we all offer up. It's why we sing rightly so. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and the wonders of his love. Because Christmas ultimately is about God's love for the world and for you and the joy that can be known in knowing Jesus Christ. So let's join together and sing Joy to the World. Thanks everyone for joining us. And let me encourage you, before you put your head on your pillow this evening, to read the full of Psalm 98 and be glad for the writing of Joy to the World inspired by Isaac Watts. But then read Luke chapter two, the Christmas story, and be glad. We hope you've had a great day, that you've enjoyed great food and enjoyed sharing good stories with each other, as well as the warmth and the family and friends that have been gathered in your space. And in it all, we pray that you will know that Jesus has come, that Jesus saves, and that Jesus blesses. So make room for Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God, and know his joy. Merry Christmas, everyone, and God bless you, one and all. <laughs>